we don't expand our imagination, we the game works Hello and welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes. Washington is broken. Those are the three words that kicked off the campaign of Arkansas Lieutenant Governor Bill Halter, who is running for Blanche Lincoln's Senate seat in the state's upcoming primary. It raised a larger debate within the Democratic Party between liberals and moderates about the direction that the party is going. So how does he plan to unseat the two-term incumbent? Well, he's joining me now from Little Rock to tell us. Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much for being with us today. And explain to us why you decided to run and get into the race at what some would say was kind of a late stage. Well, the, the reason is very simple. Uh, for far too many Arkansas families, uh, Washington is not working for them. If you look at what's happened with the Wall Street bailout bill, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayer funds going in that direction uh, and to commercial banks. And at the same time, uh, small businesses in Arkansas are having a difficult time uh, getting loans. If you look at what's, uh, what's happening just on a number of issues, uh, Arkansans look at this and they see the power of special interest uh, groups to block change, change that can be helpful to them. Uh, by contrast, you know, here in Arkansas, we've actually been able to get some things done, uh, including some things that were controversial. Uh, I pushed for a massive scholarship program in the state uh, funded by a, a newly instituted state lottery. And, you know, we took on special interest groups to get that done, special interest groups from the right and the left uh, who were opposed to that. In many cases, actually opposed to the idea of even having the voters to be allowed to decide the issue for themselves. It took three years to get it done. We took it to the people. And the fact is they, they voted for it by almost two to one. It passed all 75 Arkansas counties. Prior to that, there were only 17 out of 135 members of the Arkansas State Legislature that were publicly for uh, the scholarship program. Uh, the day after the election, all 135 were for it. Uh, and we got that passed on a bipartisan basis. We've demonstrated that with some creativity and using some common sense, uh, you can get good things done for, for Arkansas families. So what is uh, it specifically that you would do differently in Washington than what Senator Lincoln has done, for example? Well, I'd, I'd say we can go through a number of different issues, but let's just take one. Uh, the, the financial bailout bill uh, did not have nearly enough accountability in it, uh, and, and we're seeing that. We're seeing that right now uh, where we've got a situation where Main Street is hurting. Uh, we spent hundreds, hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayer funds uh, for these, uh, to, to help these financial institutions. Uh, we, we still have unemployment levels uh, at the highest levels in, in 25 years. While all of that is going on on Main Street, we've got tens of billions of dollars of, of bonuses going to uh, Wall Street investment bankers. The people in Arkansas see that, they are frustrated by it, uh, and they want a, a change in direction. And I believe they want somebody uh, to take on uh, special interest groups that seem to, to have the ability to stymie so many needed uh, reforms in, in our system. Some analysts have said that your decision to get into this race uh, makes the Democratic candidate, whether it is you or Senator Lincoln, more vulnerable to a challenge from the right because the Republicans, as you know, are already uh, duking it out, coming on strong in Arkansas. Um, how concerned are you about that, that your decision to get into this race might make it more difficult for whoever the Democratic candidate is to get elected? Well, let, let me say this. Uh, first, I, I want to have a very positive uh, upbeat and affirmative campaign about what uh, I would like to do as a United States Senator and, I, and this is really a campaign for something uh, not a campaign ag against any individual candidate. Having said that, um, look, all the public opinion polls long before I entered the race uh, show that Senator Lincoln is be behind by anywhere from 15 to over 20 points against any of the Republican, uh, the potential Republican nominees. Uh, it was not my entry into the race that, that made her weak in those polls. That, that predates uh, my, my getting into the race at all. I'm really focused on what we can do uh, to advance an affirmative agenda for, for Arkansas families. Uh, my experience is that, that competition along many fronts almost always is a good thing. Uh, and so uh, I'm looking forward to that. But, but again, this race is, is about a, a positive agenda 
for the United States Senate and not directed uh, against any one particular candidate and for that matter against any one particular candidate of either party. There's a group called Accountability Now. It was co-founded by Fire Dog Lakes, Jan Jane Hampshire. They said that they recruited you, and this is in a post that was written by Hampshire on the Huffington Post on Monday. What is your relationship with progressive uh, websites and groups like Accountability Now and MoveOn.org? Because that's likely something that Republicans will seize on if you are the nominee and say, hey, look, he's really far to the left, and we, you know, we want someone who's more in the center. Well, let me, let me say this. Um, I'm getting support from across the political spectrum. Uh, the people who recruited me into this race are Arkansans. Uh, just last Friday night, to give you one quick example, uh, I was out with my wife and our, our two one and three year old daughters. Uh, we were out with other families having pizza on a Friday night. A set of other families was a, across the way at another table. They asked, you know, are you the lieutenant governor? I said, yes, I am. And, and immediately the five adults at that table said, please run for the United States Senate. Uh, I get stopped in the street. I get emails. I've got, gotten phone calls. Uh, and people want somebody to stand up for them uh, because they believe uh, that, that they don't have the connection they need uh, to their elected leadership in Washington, and they don't feel like the process is on their side. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to welcome support from across the political spectrum. It is already the case that there are, there are uh, identified Republicans in Arkansas who are supporting my candidacy, independents, and Democrats. Uh, and if folks uh, want to go out and, and claim credit for recruiting me mm -hmm. into a race, well, that, that's their prerogative. But I can tell you I'm running for, Ar for Arkansans, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly for putting uh, Washington back on the side of Arkansas's middle-class families. But Senator Lincoln, I, I think, would describe herself as a moderate, and that's a line that she's tried to stick with very carefully here on Capitol Hill because of the, the political makeup of the state. She was on the fence when it came to health care reform, as you know. Would you say that you also consider yourself a moderate, or, or were you a bigger supporter of the, the health care reform bill than she was? Would you ca call yourself uh, more of a liberal? I, I'm going I'm to go uh, at this uh, very directly. I think these one-word labels uh, really don't do a, a, a service uh, either to the candidates or the voters. Uh, you know, on some issues I'm conservative, on some issues I'm moderate, on some issues I'm progressive. I, I just I find it uh, really difficult to summarize any candidate anywhere or any person anywhere mm -hmm. with one word. But if we're going to do that, okay, if we're going to try to put a one-word label uh, on folks, you know, then, then I choose a label that's going to unite us uh, rather than one that's going to divide us. You know, let, first and foremost, let's pick the label American. And then if you need to go to a second and a third adjective, okay, fine, fair enough. If you need to throw some nouns in there, fine, <laughs> fair enough. Go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, th this idea that somehow you can describe any candidate uh, with one adjective, I, I just don't find that to be uh, anywhere close to being true, and, and I choose not to play that game. Fair enough. Um, Arkansas Congressman Marion Barry said in, a, in an interview last week when he was asked about your potential run for the Senate, quote, he is only of consequence in his own mind, unquote, and that if you run against Senator Lincoln, that, quote, that would probably be the end of Halter's political career in Arkansas because he'll get beat and that will be the end of it. Uh, pretty harsh words from a fellow uh, uh, Arkansan. Right. What is your relationship with Congressman Barry and why do you think he would have such harsh words for you? Well, look, the fact is that uh, Congressman Barry has never been a supporter of mine. He had a different candidate in the lieutenant governor's race, and that's fine, uh, and, and that's fair enough. Look, if this is going to be about uh, who's going to be the most pleasing to Washington insiders and establishment figures, then it's not going to be me. Uh, it has never been me, and, and that's fine. Uh, I think average everyday Arkansans are pleased that we have been willing to take on special interests, that we are willing to take on the insiders, uh, and I think they're really pleased that we're, we're able to take them on and win. Uh, you know, none of the insider crowd wanted this scholarship program that I've described to you. Uh, you know, they, they blocked it in the legislature, so we just went straight to the people, gathered 135,000 signatures got it on the ballot, fought, went all the way to the state Supreme Court to keep it on the ballot, and gave Arkansans what we committed to give them, 
which is the opportunity to vote and decide that issue for themselves. I'm proud of that. As a result of that, uh, 28,000 Arkansas families this year uh, will receive up $5,000 scholarships a year to be able to go to any Arkansas uh, college or university. Uh, you know, that doesn't happen. That sort of thing had been tried for 20 years. It had been blocked. It had been rejected. Those sorts of changes do not happen unless somebody is willing to buck the system, unless somebody is willing to fight hard and say, look, I'm going to take a principled stand on this. You may not agree, but it, at a minimum, we need to take these issues to the voters. And that's what we did. Uh, and it succeeded. And I believe that there's a number of Arkansans out there uh, who would like to see a similar style of leadership in Washington, uh, where what they're seeing right now in Washington is just bickering and uh, delay and partisanship. I, I want to point out to you, you know, what happened when we took that to the people and got the vote. Subsequently, uh, we got every member of the legislature to vote for the program. Republicans, Democrats, we even have one Green Party candidate. So we had a tripartisan group uh, that, that voted for uh, the scholarship program. And everybody now is very happy about it. But, you know, without being willing to buck the system, without being willing to say, well, you know, I just disagree with you on that and we're going to fight hard for what we believe, you're not going to get the changes that people want. Got it. Well, the primary is uh, coming up. It's right around the corner. Now we see an interesting race on the left. It was already quite a food fight on the right. So uh, uh, we'll be watching. Thank you so much, Arkansas Lieutenant Governor Bill Halter. Thank you very much for joining us here on Washington Unplugged today. Thank you, Nancy. I enjoyed it. Switching gears now to the health care debate and one U.S. governor whose experiment is reducing costs both for his state and for his employees. Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels wrote an op-ed in Monday's Wall Street Journal about the benefits of health savings accounts. So if it's working in the Hoosier state, why isn't it being adopted in the rest of the country? Governor Daniels joins me by phone from Indianapolis. Governor Daniels, thank you so much for joining us. And first explain to us how HSAs work in your state. Nancy, uh, uh, it, it's fairly simple. The uh, state government, in this case the, is the employer, um, first of all uh, buys a catastrophic, uh, um, fully protective insurance policy for the employee. And then, um, because that's a lot less expensive than the traditional policies of today, um, deposits, uh, in the case of a family, $2,750 into an account, and the employee uh, controls that completely and decides what to spend, what not to spend. And um, uh, the state comes out ahead, this, and this is much, much less expensive to the employee than, um, than the, the premiums and co-pays that go with the old-fashioned plans. So how is it less expensive for the employees? Let's say they have a chronic condition. Is this something that still helps them? Yes, in a very major way. It's less expensive because they're not paying hundreds of dollars a month in premiums. That's all taken care of by the state. And secondly, uh, what we have found empirically uh, now with the benefit of, of a few years' experience is that employees um, are, are very smart consumers. This, this rather condescending notion that Americans are uh, not bright enough or, or too timid to uh, uh, be good consumers of health care uh, when they're good consumers of everything else, turns out to be wrong. And so we see a lot of behavioral changes where people push back, uh, get second opinions, uh, avoid the expensive, uh, most expensive care like emergency rooms, uh, ask for generic drugs uh, more often, these sorts of things. And they wind up with money left over and growing in these accounts, which they own that money, and uh, only rarely have to uh, be covered by the insurance premium beyond. And unlike flexible spending accounts, this money actually uh, sticks with the employee at the end of the year. They don't lose it, right? That's right. We, we now have uh, uh, 15,000 on its way, over 20,000 employees in these accounts. The average employee has uh, about $2,000 accumulated, about $30 million total and growing fast. So uh, it, it really is not surprising when you think about it. Think about the health care that's not um, part of our traditional uh, first dollar coverage, things like LASIK uh, uh, surgery or um, um, certain forms of uh, cosmetic surgery. Everybody knows the price, and the prices have been coming down because uh, customers are uh, shopping around. 
Now, here's what critics say. They say HSAs are just insurance company sponsored scams, that they only favor the wealthy and the healthy. What would you say to those people, given what you've seen in your state? I don't understand that criticism at all. You know, it's our current system that favors the wealthy, this employer uh only a deduction that we have is worth a lot more to the rich person than to a low-income person. It's one of the many bad features of the of the uh, old-fashioned system. Now, the HSA, uh, I think, respects the uh, uh, autonomy and dignity of the average uh, of, of its participant much more than this uh, paternalistic system we've had. And as I say. It's saving a lot of money for the employee, and it's saving a lot of money for the employer here, the state. By the way, uh, the, the more uh, common, I think, criticism has been that people may be too good a consumer. They might uh, short the preventive care or routine care that, uh, in, in order to husband funds. We don't find that at all. We have checked very carefully, and people are going for their physicals or getting their mammograms or prostate exams at just as uh, often as as the people in the old-fashioned plan. So if these have been such a success in Indiana, why do you think other states have been so slow to adopt HSAs, and why do you think the Democrats didn't include them in their health care bill? Uh, I was astonished to learn that at 70 percent of our employees, we are unique in America at this point. The, the penetration of consumerist plans like HSAs is only 2 percent in government, and I'm, when I asked why, the um, the uh, analysts tell me that it's because of the implacable opposition of the government unions, uh, which is too darn bad, really. I think they are, they are uh, cheating their members and, and really disrespecting their members uh, by, uh, by insisting that they stay in the old-fashioned, more expensive plans. And as to the, the Democratic Party, I guess there's just a good-faith difference of opinion. They're very wedded to the um, employer-provided... Uh, uh, top-down uh, uh, system of today, and uh, I would really hope, I only wrote the piece just so we could offer some factual evidence that there's a better way. Now, there have been a couple of recent scandals involving HSAs, uh, Chicago's Canopy Financial, Maryland-based Coventry Healthcare, where thousands of their HSA customers found that the money that they had saved went missing overnight. Is this something that concerns you with these products? How do you take steps to make sure that things like this don't happen? I never heard of any such thing, but we've had absolutely zero problems here. Um, I guess you select a financial uh, intermediary that, uh, and, uh, and oversee them tightly, which we do. Yeah, another, by the way, another one of the advantages is it's very simple system. The blizzard of paperwork stops. Everybody gets a one-page statement, looks like your bank statement, that shows what you spent and uh, how much is left. And... Um, uh, it's a whole lot easier to deal with than uh, what we've all uh, uh, become used to over these uh, decades since World War II. Right, got it. Governor, I can't let you go without asking you about some buzz that's been growing recently about you potentially considering a run for the Republican nomination in 2012. Any truth to that? Really, no. I'm, I'm heads down on... Uh, on the work of this state, as, as any state, we're, uh, we're working very hard to stay in the black and take care of people who've been uh, uh, sideswiped by the, the national recession. And, uh, you know, so ask me in a year, but I hope by then that the talk will have gone away. So these rumors are coming from somewhere else then. Where do you think they're coming from? Well, I, I'm not being cute here. I mean, the, many, many people have asked me at least to say that the that uh, maybe as opposed to heck no, and so I, I've done that, but uh, you know, I'm not doing any of the things that the aspirants to that office uh, do. Uh, you'll find me here and not in New Hampshire, I promise. Got it. Okay, well, we will check back with you in a year, as you asked, uh, but thank you so much for joining us on Washington Unplugged today. We really appreciate it. it. Thank you. And that's it for Washington Unplugged. Thank you so much for joining us. You can catch us every day at www.cbsnews.com. I'm Nancy Cordes on Capitol Hill. See you again soon. Bye-bye. If we don't expand our imagination, justification for being what you are.